Pues muy buenas tardes, muchas gracias por estar aquí, los alumnos del diplomado y los que no son alumnos del diplomado, nos da mucho gusto también recibirlos en esta aula San Ignacio de Loyola, eh, que por supuesto es el lugar de las conferencias magistrales y hoy tenemos una conferencia sumamente interesante eh, que por supuesto se liga con la conferencia inicial magistral de Belvir, eh, en donde aprendimos sobre el proceso de diseño integrado y también sobre eh, esta búsqueda ¿no? de prácticas que van más allá eh, y que intentan eh, regenerar eh, los uh, ecosistemas, intentan regenerar eh, y, y mejorar la calidad de vida eh, con eh, actividades, con reflexiones eh, y con proyectos eh, que buscan eh, soluciones mucho más profundas ¿no? desde el punto de vista de, de su contenido. Entonces, eh, te, tenemos eh, hoy la presencia de Ben Haggard eh, y también eh, Tim Murphy, los dos han trabajado junto con David también en estos laboratorios de Genesis que tienen que ver precisamente con esta intención de restaurar, de regenerar eh, los sitios que pues, a través de la arquitectura, a través de la construcción, a través del de impacto humano, pues se han, se han visto deteriorados. Eh, ben Hager es miembro fundador de Genesis en Estados Unidos, en donde ha colaborado en el desarrollo de modelos de pensamiento que integran enfoques de sistemas ecológicos y de vida con el desarrollo a gran escala. Ha trabajado con desarrolladores y equipos de diseño, agencias gubernamentales, departamentos de planificación urbana, instituciones educativas, organizaciones sin fines de lucro, entre otros, para aplicar los descubrimientos de Genesis a una amplia gama de temas de desarrollo comunitario eh, y regional. Ben ha pasado 25 años diseñando paisajes ecológicamente eh, eh, regenerativos y ha participado en proyectos de recuperación, desarrollos inmobiliarios, parques, cuentas hidrológicas, centros ecológicos, instituciones educativas y sin fines de vida. Ben se graduó en St. John's con estudios en filosofía y literatura. También estudió pintura, dibujo y crítica de arte en la escuela Leo Marshalls y permacultura con Ben Madison, que ya saben ustedes es eh, el personaje más importante de la permacultura. Eh, también me da mucho gusto eh, pues, comentarles que ya tiene algún tiempo que tanto Ben Hager como Tim Murphy han trabajado eh, conjuntamente con eh, profesores de asignatura nuestros aquí en la Universidad Iberoamericana y por lo tanto eh, nos sentimos eh, que nosotros somos los autores de haber traído estas ideas a México y que ustedes están aprovechando ahora eh, al estar por un lado en el diplomado y por el otro lado los que han tenido interés de, de venir a acudir a esta, a esta presentación. Entonces, eh, so I'd like to thank uh, Ben for being with us today again. Uh, he's been with us uh, in other occasions and you will find out that he's very inspiring. Uh, you will like his method as well, uh, very part of, uh, part of participating and uh, Tim, you will be able to work with him as well during the uh, workshop that they have organized. Uh, for anyone who is interested, uh, it's open to uh, new students. It begins today with this presentation and it goes on up, to, uh, up until Saturday, I believe, right? So I leave you with Ben and with Tim and with the rest of our group. Thank you very much. Bueno, este, pues eh, gracias Caroline. El, el día de hoy tenemos una sesión muy particular porque es un, un formato en donde el trabajo de pensamiento es, es la clave. Entonces, este, vamos a tener a lo largo del, de la sesión de hoy diferentes dinámicas y ejercicios que, que diseñaron y que vienen trabajando el grupo de Regenesis durante ya muchos años. Eh, el lenguaje que se utiliza es un lenguaje muy preciso en inglés, 
y en muchas ocasiones nos cuesta mucho trabajo identificar el, el, el significado preciso de la palabra. Este, por, lo comento no para asustarlos, sino al contrario, para incentivarlos a preguntar o a cuestionar el significado y los modelos de pensamiento que se están generando. Este, por otro lado, para el, este, la visita del, del sábado, que, 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 que cierra este, este paquete, digamos, de, de Bill, de Ben y de Tim, este, dentro del diplomado y que también cierra el taller que estamos iniciando con, con Genesis sobre desarrollo regenerativo. En la cuestión de la logística, más o menos lo hemos platicado, ya les mandaremos la información precisa de dónde vernos el jueves, de todo nos vamos a ver aquí los que están en el diplomado y a lo largo de la semana pues, estaremos platicando. Vamos a, a buscar la, la eficiencia en el, en el uso del vehículo para para hacer los, los carpools y este y pues creo que ya nada más ¿verdad? este pues bienvenidos y pues adelante ven Is that a problem for the, it's okay? No. Okay. Use that one. I generally prefer to speak without a microphone, but because they're videoing it, I'll use one. Um, <coughs> So uh, tonight we want we created something that is mostly participatory, and uh, so to begin, rather than listening to me talk, what I'd like to do is have you talk to the people that you're sitting next to. So if you would join into groups of three people, three is a good number because then everybody gets a chance to talk. So make groups of three people with people that are sitting next to you, and have a conversation about this first question. So introduce yourselves to one another. Some of you already know each other, some of you probably don't. So introduce yourselves by answering the question, what about this workshop attracted me to be here tonight? And just have a short conversation about that, and then we'll check back in. Groups of three. <laughs> from a few people um, some of the things that were coming up in terms of what was attracting you to come to this event tonight.
not everyone necessarily can hear. Um, um, you're working on um, saving a river in Puebla. And um, although you're working as an activist and working sort of on legal and policy sides, you can see there's a lot more that, that could, you could be taking into account. Great, okay. Um, so what I want to do tonight is introduce a kind of different dimension to this work. This conversation about regeneration has been going on now here at Ibero. Because Ibero has sponsored these series of lectures and the work that we've been doing, um, this has become a community of people who've gone fairly deep into this subject and have really been developing their thinking and their practice around it. And uh, so we feel like this group is ready to sort of take the next step, you know, to look at what it would mean to go a little bit deeper into what regenerative practice really means. And so uh, tonight, up until this point, most of the interest that's been generated around this idea of regenerative practice has been around uh, working out there in the world, you know. Uh, there's been a lot of excitement created around this outrageous proposal to turn the Via go back into a river. There's been a lot of talk about watershed restoration and um, thinking about um, in Valle de Bravo, for example, how to bring the rivers back there. Uh, so there's been a lot of work on and interest in how to think about the natural systems, the river systems, and what it would take to regenerate them. And uh, so that's what's built the interest up to this level. But what we believe is sort of the next level of practice has to do with the key problem that is really facing the planet and facing the, the whole sustainability movement right now, which is how do you change behaviors and change consciousness? How do you shift not rivers, but people? Because but in terms of technology and in terms of design, we have an enormous amount of understanding and ability to make positive change, right? It's the difficulty is how do we change people? Uh, I was just working with a group at Princeton University in the US, uh, and they were trying to figure out how to get Princeton University you know, involved in this question. So we asked them, uh, I was working with Bill Reed, who many of you have met, and we ask them to define what are the key questions in the world right now facing this whole movement around sustainability. And they said the first question, the most difficult, the most pressing question is how do we shift people's behavior to evolving culture? That's how they define the question. The second question they identified was how does one work effectively to integrate all of the different disciplines, all of the sciences, all of the practitioners um, to be able to deliver the kind of solutions, the complicated, integrated solutions that sustainability will require. And that is, that is a serious academic subject that no one has really been able to address yet. And the third question was, with all of the technological solutions that we could be pursuing, Princeton right now has set itself up to really work on and see if they can answer the question of energy. Because energy connected to carbon footprint, connected to global warming, is one of the huge problems facing us now on the planet. So they've decided to go after the energy piece. And so we raised the question, okay, how would you know which technological solutions you should be pursuing? And that, that question needs to be answered by thinking about the first two questions. So it moves everything off the ground of, you know, here's a problem, let's fix it. Most of the people in this room, like me, are designers, right? That's, that's what we're trained to do, it's what we love to do, it's what we bring our creativity to, is define the problem and come up with a really creative solution. But we can go out there and define problems, create solutions forever, and not shift the core problem, which is the way people are relating to natural systems. Right? So we wanted to play tonight with shifting to that different ground and working on thinking about how do we regenerate the human side of the question. And we're actually going to use 
tonight as a kind of ex exercise in regenerative development. Okay? So what I'd like to do is immediately put this back with you all and have you work on three fairly challenging questions, uh, again, in your groups of three. Okay, so uh, when you go back into your groups, um, what I'd like you to do is work on these three questions, and the questions are tricky enough that um, Raul agreed to translate them to Spanish as well, okay? Um, so the first one is, what am I deeply committed to wanting to approve in my city? Okay. And we're using city because this group is mostly coming out of the fields of engineering, architecture, urban planning, landscape architecture, right? So the context for what we're wanting to improve is the city. And mostly people here are in Mexico City, right? So in this city, what am I deeply committed to wanting to see improvement around, okay? Some people it's watersheds. For other people it might be transportation. For other people it might be social justice or poverty or whatever it is, okay? And um, what I'd like you to do is not make it generic or general, but see if you can be really specific. What, be honest. What is it I really put my time and energy into? What do I really dedicate myself to? And that's an indication of my commitment. Okay. The second question is, looking at it from another angle, what is it in the nature of my city that restrains what I'm trying to do? Okay, so I want it, I want watershed health. Okay. Um, but there's something about my city that makes that really difficult. And can I get behind what that is uh, to see what my city is really wanting to become? Okay. There's certain characteristic patterns that show up that kind of block what I'm trying to do, but if I see behind them, I can see something about what the city is trying to become in the best sense, in the positive sense. And then finally, what is a worthy pursuit that could reconcile what I am trying to improve with what my city is trying to become, and can I describe it in terms that will attract other people to become an ally and support what I'm trying to accomplish? Are there any questions about what I'm asking you to do before we start? Okay, so in groups of three, give this a shot. Let's take a little time at it, and then uh, we'll come back together and check in about it. Also, what I'd ask is, for some, it can be often difficult to really get at what the answers to these questions are. So help one another in figuring out what's really, what really am I committed to, and okay? help act as resources for uh, your partners in this little talking group. Sorry, Go ahead. Can you give yes. an example for the third one, please? Say it again? Can you give an example for the third question? For the third question? No, actually, that's where I'd like you to try and <coughs> develop a little bit of creative thinking, okay? okay. Uh, and just see what comes up, right? Uh, because we, we know we want to work on watersheds, for example. But um, how do we begin to vector what we're working on in a way that it can actually attract support? Right, so see if you can develop a little bit of creative thought around that. Okay? Good. Have fun.
coming down here to the all of you have had an opportunity to share your uh, individual insights. Sorry to those of you that arrived late that maybe you didn't have enough time to go through all the questions. Um, so uh, I'm just going to pose a few questions now and then um, ask for some responses. Um, and if you feel more comfortable responding in Spanish, that's fine. The point isn't that you report to me or to them so much as that you report to one another about what it is that you're discovering here. So, uh, who found this an easy exercise? It, it's important that um, that there be some challenge in it. So if it's easy, then probably you're coming at the questions from a place of automatic answer. Um, and we find that it's really helpful if you're destabilized, if you're actually working new ground. Uh, so who here found the, a question, one of these questions, Specifically, the second one. Hopefully, you didn't have any trouble with the first one. The second one. Who found the second one somewhat challenging? And who would like to share about what those challenges were? Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, to begin with, there's so many things that are restrained that it was hard to figure out which one was really a restraint and which one was more of a just I don't know how to. So we found, well, I personally found that bureaucracy and inefficiency of public administration is a restraint because sometimes as people that come from the academic ground, we don't know really how to skip the barriers that we have from government or public administration. So, but we have to find other ways because if we get into reforming public administration, then we're never going to get anywhere. So I think a restraint is how to creatively uh, find other ways, like sort of to go around the traditional institutional way and maybe create community to get over the barriers and, and accomplish this accomplishment. Okay, and the two of you that were resourcing her, were helping her out, um, how was it helping her get behind what it was that she saw as the constraints, the restraints to what was happening? Was that a difficult thing to do? It's, it's, an, it's a new role. And so it's, I don't expect it to be easy. But how was that for you? Was it hard to, to keep that in mind? Was it hard to be thinking that while you were listening to her, maybe there was something behind what she was saying that if you could ask the right question, it might come out for her? Find a way 
and the essence that the city is trying to become. So it's, yeah, it was shifting from the negative to positive, and how restraint can, can tell us what the, the city wants to be. And you two ladies with <coughs> Melanie, were you having any difficulty helping her get to that place, or did that seem awkward to you, or did she seem to know what she was doing? Actually, um, I think it was my example, and then she asked me another question to, to arrive to the answer, because I was saying something different. I mean, I was, um, I, don't know, I was thinking about the problem from another perspective, but I wasn't thinking like she was. So I, I thought that I had the answer and then she started asking questions to, I don't know, to, to, to find the problem that was behind. And I, I wasn't looking at it. Okay, great. Well, that's the role of a resource. Um, so this idea of um, becoming more developed as a professional, the idea of becoming um, more effective at what we do as activists or as designers or as planners um, or even as government workers or social workers, the idea of tackling it all yourself and trying to think it through yourself is a pretty difficult thing. And um, it seems to me that you, you folks are finding a way uh, through working to one, with one another uh, to get to possibly deeper answers to what's happening. One of the things that's going on here um, is that these restraints are being perceived as problems. And what happened in Melanie's group here when they when they turn that around. Wants to Pablo. Uh, restraints are usually opportunities. And that's something that we found common between all of us that the restraints that we saw uh, that sometimes enable us from doing this kind of work are exactly the points where we have advantage. For example, he saw that there's not many people doing his kind of work, and there's not many people doing his kind of work, so that's a huge advantage for him, and it was the first uh, restraint. Great. Thanks, Jim. Um, over here on the right, uh, gentleman with the red sweater, you had asked earlier on about this third question. I'm curious, in your group, how did you do with sort of coming, coming playing with this idea of a reconciling pursuit? Well, I, um, from my point of view, I think it was very difficult because um, it is, we tend to look on the outside. We, we tend to look in what we can see, what we can outside. So, um, I mean, we really did, didn't get to the point. We really didn't get to, to where we would find, or to some straight answers. Mm -hmm. It was difficult. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Okay. Yes. So, um, for us, it was like. Um, very strange in a sense because when we all agreed that the problems in the city was around transportation and public policy, infrastructure, I'm sure a lot of the people here were thinking along the same lines. And then like a pursuit was more like an idea or a vision that would bring everybody together. And it was just like, oh my god, everybody's frustrated with the traffic and rush hour here and all this time. So you know, it was just like, of course, we can get together and do something about it. Or who, like obesity, you know, who would want their kids to die before themselves? So, I mean, it's just like putting the problems in face of people was just like, of course. But sometimes we just are in a rushing life 
where you don't even stop and think that there are problems, even though they're right in front of you. But like maybe we did it wrong, but we just were thinking, well, you know, everybody would just feel eager to do something about it if they realize every second of their lives that their kids are gonna die if they don't do something about their obesity. You know, so it was more like so what I'm curious about, though, is the effect of that middle question on your group's thinking. Right? What, if anything, did it contribute? What, if anything, did it contribute? Mm -hmm. I'm the second or third? The, it's the second question. In terms of taking, OK, so yeah, there's be hard to find anyone who didn't agree that it'd be great to solve the traffic, right? but it doesn't get solved, right? They think it gets worse, right? So that's the restraint. There's something in there that's a restraint, right? And as this group was pointing out, we tend to look at restraints as, as you know, the problem, right? But if you can dig deep enough behind it, you can find um, sort of its positive dimension, right? The opportunity is the way that Paolo was describing it, or a way of reframing it so that you can see, have a new insight into why does this thing that everyone agrees is a problem never shift, right? Can we get at an understanding of this city that would allow us to see it in a new light and have totally new insight about how you go to work on that, which is starting to work on your question, right? It's like, it's, in a way, I have to put myself aside and what, uh, what we all agree about and see it from the side of the city, right? This big, messy, chaotic, hard to understand organism that seems to have a mind of its own when it comes to things like traffic. That's kind of the, so we're not gonna solve any of these big questions tonight, that's not the point. It's to play with the way we think about them, right? To actually regenerate this is the word that we use for it, to actually shift our thinking and see if we can discover a new way of thinking through asking really different questions of ourselves. Okay? You want to dance? Just want to So if you were coming at it asking the same questions that you always ask, or from what it is that you already know, um, that's often not enough. What you have to do is you have to come at it from the realm of what you don't know, that you don't know. So by looking what is behind what is causing the problem, what are the behavior patterns, the mechanisms, the aspirations, usually if there are aspirations behind what is generating the problem, then there are positive ways to create a reconciliation around those aspirations. Okay, we're gonna come back to this later on in the evening. There's an underlying structure to these, this set of questions, okay? And we'll actually make that more explicit uh, later on in the evening. Um, but let's, let's move on to the next piece, not the next slide yet. Um, uh, so the title of this, talk is Story of Place. And we put that title in because it's one of the things we've been working on here for the last couple of years. We did a series of workshops here at Ivero with faculty and students and alumni and other people trying to get a sense of who is this big, sprawling, crazy city? Um, and, and what is its character? And how does it work? And how does it, you know, how would you come into a, some kind of relationship with it? And um, so I just wanted to do a little bit around what that work is about, right? And then um, step back from it and talk about how it relates to the larger uh, discipline that we call regenerative development. Uh, first of all, when we use the word place, what we mean is the sum total of all of the energies, all of the forces that that make a given landscape, a, li a given part of the world, what it is, right? So place includes the landscape, 
It includes the ecosystems, it includes the watershed, it includes people, it includes urban form and architecture, culture, food, all of those things taken together make Mexico City different from, um, from Valle del Bravo, or Guadalajara, or Paris, or Berlin, or Shanghai, or New York, or wherever, right? Each of those, we're talking about cities at the moment, are really distinctive, right? They have, you can feel it when you, when you arrive. They have a different energy, people behave differently, people, even though we all more or less dress the same, you can really tell the differences. I mean, they, they're subtle, but they're pervasive, right? And they go from the way the land is formed all the way up through the way people eat and when they go to bed at night and all of it, right? And that's true at every scale, right? So this neighborhood is different from other neighborhoods in Mexico City, right? This little campus is different from what's around it, right? So each place has its own nature, its own qualities. Um, the story of place the work that we have been working with over the last few years has to do with how do we look at all of the data, all the information, all of the research, all of the science, all of the policy work and, and theory and all the rest of it about a given place, right? Which if you were to assemble it, it would be a library, you know, assemble a history and you know, the studies of all of the different things going on in Mexico City, you can fill a library, right? Um, so you can't necessarily understand something that's living just through the data that describes it, right? There's another process that has to do with looking through all of that to see if you can get at what's at the heart of it, right? What makes this place unique? What is its core, essential character? Right? And if you can do that, if you can see through all of this stuff and see that core essential character, there are a number of things that does for you. One is it puts people in touch with what they really care about. Because right? most people love the places that they live. They might get frustrated with the traffic or whatever, but generally we tend to really care about the place we live. So if we can put ourselves in touch with the heart of it, not only does it speak to what we care about, but it speaks to what our neighbors care about. Right? It becomes a kind of common touchstone that many, many people share. Right? It's not political. This is what's interesting. Right? It cuts across different kinds of political ideologies, different beliefs about what's right and wrong, that underneath caring, I love this place, right? I, I want to see it be a better place than it is, is, is if not universal, it's very, very common, right? So it gives us something that pulls people together instead of dividing them up. So that's one of the powers of it. Um, let's see, there's one other thing I wanted to say about that. Oh, yeah. The other thing that it allows is um, if I can begin to see this city, right, as a living organism, it allows me to think differently about it. That's what this middle question starts to play with, right? It allows me to see the problems in a different light, right? It allows me to see what, uh, in English, we would say is emergent, right? Things that haven't yet happened, but that are beginning to show up, right? Patterns that will express themselves in the future. You can begin to see that if you're seeing this as a whole, you, and, and thinking of it as a, this, through this idea of a story place allows you to see it as whole and unified and engaged in certain kinds of behaviors, right? And that's one of the ways that it begins to be possible to uh, start to find opportunities within that system to make big changes through small efforts, right? I love this work that's been going on with the Viaducto. Uh, because it's outrageous, you know. You know, it's it'll never happen, but why not? Right? And it's it's so outrageous, it's kind of fun and inspiring and crazy and gets people interested and 
gets radio and television talk show hosts into it, and newspapers, right, whatever, right? And who knows, out of that kind of crazy inspiration, things can happen. Whether they happen at Viaducto isn't as important as people are being inspired about what's possible here. And the reason that's important, this is connected to um, what we call self-organizing systems, right? Anything that's alive tends to organize itself to be able to pursue its purpose, right? And so one of the opportunities in as wild and crazy a place as Mexico City is, partly because it's a very youthful city and it's a very energetic city, is if you can inspire people, if people can sort of see possibilities, um, all kinds of stuff starts to bubble up, right? It, it, like the, you know, the lakes that used to be here, all kinds of stuff can begin to happen that is not top-down, is not political, right? It's not about control and central organization. It's about setting an overall course that people can begin to find their way with re relate relate to and find their way with respect to. Okay. So that's enough on story of place. It's something that um, Tim and my other colleagues developed over many years within Regenesis because we were trying to figure out a way how to engage communities in this thing that we call regenerative development. And Bill Reed spoke to a number of you not so long ago about this whole idea of regenerative development and how regenerative development is primarily focused on potential, not on problem solving. And so um, what this was about, the story of place idea, was how do we go into a community and help a community see its own potential, right? see what it could be, see what it has the potential to become, right? and see if that doesn't unleash all kinds of new energies that go right over the problems that seem to keep us stuck today. Right? Traffic and the way the rivers are being treated here is just one example, two examples. Um, so, with that in mind, what I'd like to do is turn you loose on another example, uh, another exercise. And this time it might be valuable to actually have someone go through the exercise first and then we'll turn you loose on it as groups. Um, so let's put the next slide up. Okay, so these are four questions. Again, there's a structure behind this, uh, what we call a framework. And um, they are questions designed to shift the level of thinking that we're engaging in. All of these represent an important level of thinking. So for example, the first question is, if you want to improve how the system works, what are all the operations you need to think about? So the city has to be able to work. It has to operate. It has to function. Uh, the street lights have to work. You know, the toll booths. The, we couldn't get out of the airport last night because the toll booths didn't work. Um, OK, so that, that's one level of thinking right? that needs to be addressed. Right? And if you work on that, a certain kinds of ideas come up. The next question, what would you need to work on in yourself and your environment to always perform at your best, no matter what is shifting around you? Totally different question. Right? And yet, it's also critical to be thinking about if we want to transform something. The third question changes level again. Now, take a step back. What does this commitment that you were talking about in your earlier conversation, what does this commitment really mean to you? What's the meaning behind it? You care about it. What does it mean to you personally? Why is it important and compelling to you? And the fourth question is, OK, if you can really get a handle on why it means so much, how would you work on shifting the universe of interest? I'll come back to that in a second. The universe of interest so that the meaning you experience could be brought forward into the world. Okay. And what I mean by universe of interest is, um, let's do a, a simple example of um, somebody loves playing soccer, right? football. And um, 
So they could be working up here on everything I need to be thinking about in terms of playing football and making sure the game, you know, I'm, I'm playing my top best, making sure that the field is dry and, you know, everything's where it needs to be, making sure the ball has the right air, you know, you, there are a million things involved in playing a game of soccer, right? And really being good and thinking about making sure all of them are working, right? The next one is, okay, sometimes I'm playing at my best, sometimes I'm not. What's the difference? Why? What do I need to work on to be able to always perform at the best that I'm capable of? And then the third one is, why does this mean so much to me? What, are, what is it I really care about soccer? Right? Why do I play it so passionately? I, by the way, am a terrible soccer player. Um, and then lastly, um, how would you work on shifting the universe of interest, meaning soccer, this whole world of soccer, right? You know, it has players all over the world, it has fans, people are crazy about it, they love it, right? How would I work on shifting that world so that the meaning I experience with regard to soccer could be brought into, the, into our world in a much more profound way, okay? So that's the exercise. Can I get a volunteer? Would somebody like to um, sort of work this a little bit in front of the group just so that we can see how it works? Get somebody to be willing? Yeah, okay. Would you mind coming down here? So do you want to sit or stand? I would rather sit, yep. Okay. Let me put this out here. And we'll let Ben begin his grilling. <laughs> okay, are you ready? I'm ready. Spotlight. <laughs> okay, so what would you say is this area of interest that's really compelling to you? Um, I would say quality of life, and but focused on environment. I think it's a basic component. Okay. So what specifically about that is really passionately engaging to you, that you really work on, that you're studying, that you're, you're trying to really make a difference around? Um, recovering water in, for example, my final project for my uh, degree in architecture is trying to recover a piece of the lake. Because not only is it an environmental advantage, but also a cultural and social one. Okay, so let's call it recovering the lake. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? Okay, so operationally, what are all the things that you need to pay attention to? This is exactly what you've been working on, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, what are, don't, not literally all of them. Just give us a quick sketch of all the things that you really have to think about to pull that off. Well, for starters, there's a question of place because it's all built on. So either you move people or what are you going to do to get space? And then there's all the technical issues. And then there's, uh, again, government and administration issues as because it's a totally different way of building cities, so it, it's not going to be easy to get like permits or whatever. And then um, getting people convinced that it's a good idea because some people see it as a risk. For example, I had never thought of it as a risk, and then like my aunt, she said, "But it's going to get flooded, all you know." And I was like, "Okay, I hadn't thought of that. It's something that that yeah, it could be a risk." And then. Um, like water quality of the lake and what are we going to do in terms of like landscape and other details. And okay, there's more but take decent care of it and not and, uh, don't <coughs> break it yeah. in. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay, so you all get the picture. That, those are the operational questions. And they can get very sophisticated and very deep. Right? It's a lot to take into account. This is a very ambitious project. Right? Okay, so now let's shift levels. What would you need to work on in yourself and in your environment so that you're always performing at your best no matter what's going on around you, right? Because you've set out to make a difference about this lake. Uh, what would I need to change in myself, not to get the lake, but in, like, in general, yeah. or? Well, you have good days and bad days, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're really compelling. Some days are better. Some days are definitely better than others, right? Uh, so, some days, so-and-so in the city bureaucracy, you want to kill them, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. That's about you, right? Yeah. We like to talk about them as being the bad people, right? But it's really about the fact that we want to kill them is about us, yeah. right? And, and it has a big impact on how effective we're able to be in getting that lake back in there, yeah. right? So I'm mean, inviting you to think at a totally different level. It's no longer about them. It's about how you work on you so that you're actually effective when you're interacting with the bureaucracy or with the neighbors who think you're going to flood their house, and, right? Okay. So what would you have to work on there? Well, one thing would be effective communication, and that begins with not thinking that my idea is the only good idea. And even though I think it's a really good idea, <laughs> uh, I have to be able to see what the other person, why my aunt thinks it's a risk, you know? Because she's really, she's not saying something that's nonsense, nonsense to her. It's something that really makes sense to her. So one thing that I can work on is trying to understand the other, but deeply understand the other person's point of view, like where she's coming from, that's one thing. And then understanding that, that it, this is a process and having like patience to like cultivate the result that you're expecting, this is another thing because we want it all to happen right away. Right? So this is another thing. Um, so with regard to that, would it be helpful to really have an understanding of how process works? Yeah, of course. Yeah, there's so many variables. And then if you're dealing with people, it's like infinite. Yeah, that's what I mean. I don't mean a process that's like a linear process. Well, first, you know, getting the approvals through the city. I'm talking about the process of building support for what you want to see happen. Yeah, that's right. So that's, that's a whole complicated topic. Yeah. Anything else that you want to be working on or paying attention? Maybe be able to see exactly like I said that I hadn't thought about my aunt's point of view, being able to like decompose my, my project or my idea into all the other possible like influences or ways that it could take to be able exactly to talk about it in different ways other than what convinces me. So seeing the components, yeah. Yeah, we often talk about that in terms of stakeholders. There are different constituencies out there that have really different attitudes and a different investment in either keeping things the same or changing them. And being able to talk, work with them in terms of what their investment is and not assume that their investment is the same as your investment, right? Okay. So these are all valuable things to be Yeah, yeah for sure. All right, good, okay. So we're two levels up, right? And we've also, I, I, I'm wondering if it's, I'm hoping it's becoming apparent that the two conversations were really different and what's being looked at are different. Okay. All right, let's try the next one. What does this commitment to getting this lake restored, what does it really mean to you? Why is it so important? It's something that I can't really explain because it's, um, then from like my childhood, you know. I think that this, I think it all started when I was little and I saw the paintings of the lake, like reconstructions, and I thought, why did we transform that into this, you know? And it, I think it's a matter of ethics, like how you choose to live on Earth. And I think that people that have a will to, to live in harmony, if you like, with Earth, shouldn't be the victims of like, real estate developers and people who take decisions for us, right? I, I'm sure that most people don't like the physical city just as it is. So we should be able to take decisions on it. And so for in one way, it's a question of, this was a beautiful place, let's recover it. And in another way, it's also a matter of ethics and like a political stand. I am also a member of this community. And I would like to take decisions on it and build a better one other than what they have done with it. So one of the things that, one of the kind of sources of meaning is that this is a beautiful place. Yeah. And it's almost, I'm reading into what you're saying, but it's almost painful. No, it's painful. It is painful. Yeah. yeah. To see what's happened to that yeah. beautiful place, right? Uh, is Mexico City a beautiful place? In some sort of way. It is a beautiful place. It's like cluttered over. You know, it's, 
but it is a beautiful place. Right? It's a powerful place. It's a beloved place. Okay? That's the meaning behind what you're doing. Yeah? Okay. And you saw what happened in the room, yes? Yeah. Yes, it is a beautiful place. Yeah. 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 So, in there, in describing that, you may have noticed that you, when you were looking at what it was that really inspired you about this place, you got into the realm of constraints and you started talking about them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, from what you said in the second question, that's something that you need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Because when you start making it an us and them yeah, thing, thing yeah. they can't be enrolled in yeah. what it is that you want to do because they're outside of it. Yeah. I agree. Okay. okay. So, now we can begin to look at this in terms of there's a whole world uh, that has an interest one way or another in this question of the lake. The whole world connected to it. You know, there are major, major sewer, you know, agencies responsible for getting water out of the valley, right? To keep the flooding from happening. There are people who have, you know, land and commercial interests in keeping it one way or another, right? There's, there's, there are environmentalists who see that restoring the health of the watershed is critical to the future of the city. There's a whole world around this question. It's not a simple question. You should, right? So if you started from being in touch with this, um, uh, it's not an understanding, it's more like connection to the fact of the beauty of this place. The fact of the beauty of this place. You start from that connection. How do you begin thinking about shifting that world? Um, I think it kind of goes back to another question that we had before, which was how to get like allies. Everybody in the end wants like a better place to live, right? So the this idea of beauty and and a better place to live is something that even the uh, sewage company owners have. So how can we all work it out to make a better place for everyone? Because finally, if most people are living in not the best conditions, this affects the sewage owner too. Like It all comes back to them anyway. So it's better for everybody to give everybody a better place to live. And so, yeah, appealing to the sense of, of community is better than not community. Okay, so I invite you to keep, because this is your work, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I invite you to keep working that last question. Okay. Uh, in the sense of, put it, put it to bed in the back of your mind, right? Let it just sit there and see if stuff doesn't start to bubble up that is unexpected. Okay. Like new ways of looking at it. Okay. Right? Okay. Uh, tell me your name. Lucia. Lucia, thank you Lucia thank you. so much. Yeah. Thank you Lucia. Okay, I think it's time for a short break. Uh, so let's take about a 10 or 15 minute break. And then when we come back, we're going to get back into our small groups. And we're going to do the same exercise about the things that each of us really cares about. Okay? And you saw, just before we go, you saw me actually resourcing Lucia. Right? It wasn't heavy handed or heavy duty, but it was helping her get to what's really at the core of this. What's really important. right? And then how do we start to build, because this doesn't work unless it's really important to her, right? It doesn't cause us to ch want to change the way we work, the way we behave in the world, until it's something that really matters, okay? So I invite you, with the members of your group, to be resources, to help them get to what really matters, okay? Let's take a 15-minute break. We'll start up again.